This video is about the first step in vision, photo transduction. Our sense of vision is truly amazing. Photoreceptors, that is rods and cones, are specialized cells in the retina that sense incoming light and begin the process of generating a nerve impulse. This is called phototransduction. In this video we are going to explore how it works in some detail. In previous videos we have covered the structure of the eye and how the various parts work. The cornea and lens focus the incoming light onto the retina. The retina is a layer of nerve tissue that lines the inside of the eye. It senses the light and turns that into a pattern of nerve impulses that are sent along the optic nerve to the brain. The light sensing cells are the rods and cones. Cones are for sensing color in daylight and when it gets dark rods take over but they do not provide color. In this video we are going to discuss what happens in the photoreceptor. Before we get into details let us start with an overview of the whole process. First off we will be talking mainly about rod cells in the retina. Cones are similar with a few differences we will mention at the end. The process of phototransduction occurs in the outer segment of the rod cell. The rod cell communicates with other nerve cells at the synapse. Regeneration of the retinal, the so-called visual cycle, occurs in a separate cell altogether, the retinal pigment epithelial cell. 1. In the dark, a photoreceptor has a baseline amount of activity going on, creating a resting charge, just like other nerve cells. 2. When light strikes, it activates a cascade of events that changes the cell charge, thus signaling arrival of a photon. This is the phototransduction step. 3. The way the charge behaves and is transmitted is different than you might expect. 4. Just as it is important that the system turn on rapidly, it's also important that it be able to turn off rapidly. When you push a doorbell, you want it to ring once, then stop. 5. Then the system has to reset rapidly enough to be ready for arrival of the next photons. If you are counting, that was five different but important steps, all involved in the first step in vision. We will cover the first three steps in this video, part one. The remaining two will be covered in the next video. As we said a minute ago, the retina is a layer of nerve tissue that lines the inside of the eye, which senses light and turns that into nerve impulses that are sent along to the brain. This is the view we get when we look directly into the eye. The retina itself is actually clear, so you see through it to the pigment layer behind. In this diagram of the layers of the retina, you can see, somewhat unexpectedly, the rods and cones are located at the bottom, so incoming light has to pass through several layers of nerve cells to reach them. Now, the rod cell has several parts. The outer segment is where the photons are detected. The inner segment is important in energy production. Then there is the nucleus and on the near end is the synapse which connects to the other nerve cells. Taking a closer look at the outer segment, this is where the light sensing part of phototransduction takes place. Within the outer segment there are these pancake-like plates called discs which contain many many molecules of rhodopsin which is what actually absorbs the photon of light. What kind of numbers are we talking about? In an average mouse retina, there are 6.4 million rods. The outer segment has a length of 23.8 microns, with each outer segment containing on average 800 disks. Each disk contains about 8,000 rhodopsin molecules, which coincidentally works out to 6.4 million rhodopsin molecules per rod. Other sources give slightly different calculations, but it is still a very large number. Within the rod outer segment, here are the locations of the major actors in the phototransduction cascade. There's a lot going on here, 
So to give you a starting place, let's briefly lay out the core of the process, then we will go into details. We begin with rhodopsin sitting in an inactive but ready state. An incoming photon is absorbed by the rhodopsin, which causes it to change from standby to active. Rhodopsin, when activated, acts on a second actor called transducin, causing it to become active. The effect of active transducin is to activate an important enzyme called phosphodiesterase, PDE for short. The activated PDE breaks down a molecule of cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP is responsible for keeping open a channel which allows positive sodium and calcium ions to leak into the cell and control the amount of its electrical charge. When cyclic GMP decreases, the channel closes and causes the electrical charge in the cell to increase. See the change in the voltage meter? That increase in electrical charge is then relayed to by other cells in the retina, eventually sending that information to the brain. That is phototransduction in a nutshell. Think of it as ringing a doorbell. Now, let's look closer. Here we are with the rod cell in the dark where it is creating its resting potential. All of our actors are present and we will start with them in the off state. First, note that most of the actors are embedded within or attached to the disk disk we talked about before. But one major actor, the CNG channel, is embedded in the cell membrane. GC stands for guanylate or guanylyl cyclase. It is an enzyme that turns GTP into cyclic GMP, which is key to how our cell behaves. Here's what that looks like. Even in the dark, guanylate cyclase maintains a low level of activity turning out cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP acts on the cyclic nucleotide channel, labeled CNG, keeping it open. Open means it allows sodium and calcium ions to passively travel from outside the cell to inside. As positive ions move inside the cell, that is part of setting the resting electrical potential. This all happens in the dark. The arrival of light triggers the following cascade of events. An arriving photon is absorbed by and there, thereby activates a molecule of rhodopsin, which activates transducin, which then acti activates phosphodiesterase. PDE then eats up the cyclic GMP, turning it into 5' prime GMP. Without cyclic GMP to keep it open, the CNG channel closes. The closed channel means sodium and calcium ions can no longer get into the cell. The voltage changes, becoming more negative. Before we go on, it's worth a minute to put this signaling system into a larger context. Cells need to be able to communicate with one another. One way they do that is by having receptors located in the cell surface. That way a cell in one location can secrete a small molecule that can be carried by the bloodstream throughout the body, relaying a message to influence behavior of other cells at a distance. Adrenaline would be a good example. G protein coupled receptors comprise the largest class of these membrane receptors. The name describes the setup. The receptor is embedded in the cell surface. It interacts with a G protein. The G means it contains a molecule of GDP which controls its activity. The receptor causes the GDP to change to GTP and the G protein molecule thereby becomes active. The G protein in turn activates an effector molecule its action resulting in some meaningful cellular activity. GTP is this creature, guanosine triphosphate. Guanine plus ribose makes guanosine with three phosphates attached. This is GDP, guanosine diphosphate, and cyclic GMP. What an important family this turns out to be. In our case, Rhodopsin is the G-protein coupled receptor. 
The G protein is transducin, which we'll get to in a minute. PDE is the effector. There are about 800 G protein coupled receptors in the human genome, capable of sensing a wide variety of chemicals and even photons. The receptors all share the same shape, similar to rhodopsin, with seven helical segments that span the cell membrane. The G proteins all share a similar three-part structure. The action of the effector would be different depending on the type of cell. In this case, the mission of the system is to detect light. Here is the rhodopsin molecule shown in its crystalline form. The 3C9L is the index in the protein data bank. If you are a fan of biology or biochemistry, this site is fun to visit, even just for browsing, with a lot of information. As a protein, rhodopsin is made up of a long chain of amino acids. In humans, 348. That long chain folds itself into a higher level structure. In this case, you can see seven regions that have twisted themselves into heli helical segments. Here is the ribbon version we showed before. Here is yet another way to represent the structure of rhodopsin. This shows the helices as cylinders, specifically seven cylinders extending across the cell membrane. They are displayed as if they were flat. This is a more simplified version showing the cylinders closing into its natural concave shape. Look again at the crystal structure and you can see the concave shape and this is another way of showing the same thing. Opening the cylinders up shows a molecule of retinal created, cradled in the middle. Retinal is the molecule that responds to the photons of light. It has this function in most organisms that detect light. The protein part, all the cylinders, is called an opsin, which normally has a certain action it performs. Whether it is active or not is controlled by the retinal. When retinal is in the bent 11 cis form, the opsin is inactive. Retinal is thus termed an inverse agonist, meaning it is preventing the rhodopsin per from performing its usual action. Here is the retinal in the bent 11 cis form. The bent form is an uncomfortable position for this molecule. Given a chance, it would prefer to be straight. When a photon of light is absorbed by an electron in the 11-12 double bond, it is promoted to a higher energy level. Technically, the pi bond is disrupted and the chain can rotate about a single axis of the sigma bond. The result is that the chain is temporarily free to rotate its, to its preferred position before the double bond is re-established. In other words, the bent 11 cis form changes into the straight all trans form. That shape change in the retinal triggers a change in the opsin, which goes through several shape changes in a fraction of a second. Each of those intermediates has a name, ending in the active configuration of Meta rhodopsin 2. It is often given the shorthand R star. A lot of study has been invested in understanding the rhodopsin molecule. It has been the paradigm for understanding G protein coupled receptors. The shape change in rhodopsin consists of shifts in the position of three of the helical segments numbered 5, 6, and 7. This forms a pocket now accessible for coupling to the G protein. In the cascade of rhodopsin activation, the energy comes from absorption of the photon by retinal. There are a number of intermediate forms shown here with their real names. They are followed then by the forms that interact with the G protein. These are metarhodopsin 1 and 2. Metarhodopsin 2 being the one that affects change in the G protein. This all happens in a fraction of a second. The rhodopsin then interacts with transducin, which is attached to the cell membrane to keep it in proximity to the rhodopsin. Transducin has three parts, one alpha, one beta, and one gamma. The alpha subunit has a molecule of GDP nested inside. This is transducin in its inactive form. 
When rhodopsin becomes active, it acts on the alpha subunit of transducin, affecting an exchange of GDP for GTP. Then the alpha subunit separates from the beta and gamma subunits, and it is ready for action. One rhodopsin activates 200 to 400 transducins per second, depending on the species. Here is the crystal structure of transducin. The effector in this cascade is phosphodiesterase. PDE has four subunits, one alpha, one beta, and two gamma subunits. The gamma subunits ordinarily keep the enzyme mostly inactive. When the transducin becomes active, it binds to the gamma subunits of the PDE. When they are occupied, the alpha and beta subunits become active. Active PDE then breaks down cyclic GMP to plain GMP. This occurs at a very rapid rate, roughly 2,000 per second. This crystal structure of PDE shows the catalytic site. It is occupied by an inhibitor you may recognize, as well as the gamma subunit. Remember guanylyl cyclase. Its importance lies in the fact that it produces cyclic GMP, which keeps the CNG channel open. It typically occurs as a dimer, a pair, located in the disc membrane. Off to the side are guanylyl cyclase activating proteins, GCAPs for short, which control the activity of guanylate cyclase based on the level of calcium present. When calcium is low, the GCAPs turn on guanylate cyclase to make more cyclic GMP. That in turn opens the CNG channel, which lets more sodium and calcium into the cell. We will discuss the role of calcium a little later. In the dark, guanylate cyclase functions at a low level of activity, producing a baseline amount of cyclic GMP, thus setting the resting potential of the cell. Here is the crystal structure of guanylate cyclase. Taking a closer look at the CNG channel shows it is made up of four subunits, three A1 subunits and one B1 subunit. When the concentration of cyclic GMP decreases, the channel closes, causing the cell to increase in electrical charge. In the dark, when cyclic GMP is available, it binds to the subunits and opens the central pore in the channel. That allows sodium and calcium to pass from the outside of the cell to the inside. In the dark, the internal membrane voltage is negative. When light arrives, cyclic GMP level is reduced the channel closes and the internal cell voltage becomes more negative. This is the crystal structure of the CNG channel viewed from above with four subunits and a central opening. This is the structure in schematic form of two of the subunits of CNG, the A1 and B1 subunits, intertwined as they would be in the cell membrane. The C cyclic GMP binding sites are shown controlling the opening of the central pore. We are not quite done with the important molecules. This is an exchanger. It is part of a larger group of transport proteins whose function is to control movement of calcium from inside to outside of the cell. NCKX1 is located in the rod outer segment. It passes sodium, calcium, and potassium. Exchange of these ions is important in regulating the cell membrane potential. Specifically, it exchanges four sodiums for one calcium and one potassium. It is physically connected to the alpha subunits of the CNG channel. This happens to be NCKX2 found in cones and neurons in the brain. Now, we have seen all the individual parts. It is time to connect light-dark changes to cell signaling. Now, let us consider the photoreceptor as a nerve cell and figure out how the membrane charge works. I think this part tends to be confusing because most presenters only talk about what happens in the outer segment that we have discussed so far. To understand it, you need to see the bigger picture. Nerve cells have a certain amount of electrical charge when they are primed and ready for action. In the photoreceptor cell, this starts in the inner segment 
with sodium-potassium ATPase, which pumps sodium out and potassium into the cell using ATP for energy. Second, there is a potassium channel which lets potassium leak back out of the cell. This is passive because there's more potassium inside the cell than out. This goes on until it reaches an equilibrium with a minus charge inside the cell and a plus charge on the outside. In a typical nerve cell, this might be between minus 70 and minus 90 millivolts. However, the photoreceptor has two more channels. In the outer segment, there is the exchanger we just talked about, passing sodium, calcium, and potassium. And lastly, the CNG channel. When cyclic GMP is present, the channel is open and the sodium and calcium ions flow into the cell, reducing the interior negative charge. In the dark, this would typically be minus 50 millivolts, the resting charge. When light arrives, the cyclic GMP level is reduced, the CNG channel closes, the positive ions st stop entering the cell. Then the internal cell charge becomes more negative. There is more to say about calcium, which we will talk about in part two. And here is the end of the line. In the dark, when the membrane charge is less negative, the synapse produces more glutamate. If some light arrives, the cell charge becomes more negative and the synapse produces less glutamate. If a lot of light arrives, the cell charge becomes maximal and glutamate secretion stops. And that is how the signal is transmitted to the bipolar cell, the next one in the chain of neural transmission. That may seem a bit counterintuitive, but that is how it works. Okay, that was a lot. Good time for a recap. What we have discussed so far is phototransduction has occurred in the outer segment of the rod cell. In the dark, the low level of guanylate cyclase activity results in enough cyclic GMP available to keep the CNG channel open, and that sets the resting charge of the photoreceptor membrane. When light arrives, rhodopsin is the receptor molecule. Incoming light is absorbed by the embedded retinal, which causes it to change shape which in turn affects the shape of the opsin molecule, causing it to take its active form, metarhodopsin 2. The active rhodopsin then activates intermediate transducin, which activates phosphodiesterase, which then breaks down cyclic GMP molecules. As the amount of cyclic GMP is reduced, the CNG channel closes and the internal cell charge becomes more negative. That finally results in a change in glutamate secretion at the synapse with the bipolar cell. The switch is turned on, signaling that light has arrived. The doorbell has been rung. This is a good place to end part one. In part two, we will go on to talk about how the signal is turned off. You want the doorbell to ring once, not keep ringing. We will see how retinal is regenerated some technical details, and a look at some differences between rods and cones. So, check in for part two. If you want to read more, here are a set of selected references.